Hello. So today I want to propose to you a history of Israel-Palestine as a housing enterprise in a long ongoing history of gain and loss of individual and national home. So I would like to start with this scene from the 2011 housing protest in Israel, which drew millions of Israelis to the streets in demand of housing. In this image taken in Tel Aviv, uh, we can see a young man sitting on a light pole holding a hand-drawn Israeli flag whose centerpiece, the National Religious Star of David, is replaced with a house. So the flag declares housing as the centerpiece of membership in Israeli society, of Israeli citizenship, rather than religion, ethnicity, or nationality. Uh, moreover, considering the full urban and political context of this statement and of the housing uh, protest movement, we can see in this full image, on the, on the left, government office towers, on the right, the iconic communication tower of the Israeli army's headquarters at the center of Tel Aviv, and the light pole itself, which is very recognizable of the Tel Aviv Museum of Art, uh, facing this military base. Namely, this flag proclaims housing to be a stronger claim for rights, citizenship and identity, and a stronger raison d'etre than military power, Hebrew culture, or mere sovereignty. So in this sense, this uh, study that I'm presenting to you offers a complementary historiography and an alternative thesis for Zionist sovereignty vis-à-vis -vis the well-known thesis extending to the gain of strategic military superiority through service of Western or colonial powers to a space of Hebrew culture. So the strategy I point to, housing, enabled the gradual accumulation of future citizens since the 1860s in the name of whom the State of Israel would eventually be founded. Upon statehood, this strategy established the nation state by nationalizing immigrants and including them into the, uh, the state via concrete housing in the national home. And since 1967, uh, whatever you think about it, it served of uh, expanding the nation state by housing citizens beyond its borders. At the same time, housing has historically allowed citizens to negotiate their status and membership in the national home via struggles over individual homes. So what you see here on your left, you see um, Palestinian Israelis protesting housing demolitions. At the center, Mizrahi Jews uh, protesting for access to public housing. And on the right, um, a scene from the 2011 housing protest. Uh, the cultural products that those housing protests uh, produced like this flag, demonstrate that housing is an important undercurrent for many segments of Israeli society and that it requires historization and theorization. So the tent was the most pertinent cultural artifact of the 2011 protests. Um, and it was used by protesters of all walks of Israeli society to invoke their dwelling histories. And it enabled um, the laying together of uh, tents protesting and invoking the histories of different and conflicting social groups in uh, Israeli society. For example, the 1948 uh, tent camp that invokes the Palestinian Nakba at the heart of the Israeli space on Rothschild Boulevard. So the tent is rarely read as architecture. It is provisional, temporary, precarious dwellings uh, which do not last, do not involve uh, canonic design, and often do not leave much archival traces. Yet it invokes the precarious dwelling histories of several conflicted segments of Israeli society, invoking the gain and loss of individual homes by the hands of one another. So from, from left to right, we see uh, socialist Zionist pioneer settlements of the uh, early 1920s, where some of the key social principles of Zionism were framed in the collection uh, Our Community, whose cover image uh, was the tent. Uh, in the middle, we see the Palestinian Nakba, whose tent camps uh, housing by the United Nations, while long ago replaced with permanent structures and densifying urban fabrics, maintains the demand for a return via invoking the cultural image of the tent as marker of identity and political rights here on a graffiti on a wall in uh, one of the camps near Bethlehem. 
So uh, on the left, we have post-independence immigrant camps housing primarily Jews from Muslim countries, uh, Mizrahim, in substandard housing that to this day is associated with the precarious social position uh, and marginalization of Mizrahim in Israeli society. So we see here uh, um, the fault lines of Israeli society, three distinct social segments that are very conflicted to one another, all invoking the tent as a claims for rights for place and for rights for contemporary housing, um, showing how important this, the cultural artifact of housing is for making uh, claims for citizenship and membership in Israeli society. So my main claim, my main thesis, uh, is that housing is the cultural object forming Israeli society around it in an agonistic conflict that cannot be resolved, becoming the object of conflict, uh, um, uh, to paraphrase Chantal Mouffe, that brings them together because it divides them. So to stress this point, I show you quite unbelievable images, if you adhere to standard politics of Israel-Palestine, um, images of a joint march uh, for public housing by the Jaffa protesters, who were our Palestinian activists affiliated with the Pal Palestinian Nationalist uh, Party, together with the Tikva neighborhood, which is the traditional stronghold of uh, Netanyahu's Likud party. So in order to produce this march, uh, the two uh, communities had to negotiate, to collect money, produce those banners in Hebrew and Arabic, and they were walking in the street chanting in Hebrew and Arabic um, together for uh, the same cause. Um, and this is very interesting because those communities are bitter enemies at the national front, national home front, but are recognizing each other's rights to individual housing and the right to the city. Um, in, in this um, negotiations. So the immediate question would be, uh, why housing? Uh, why is housing an important enough, uh, so important enough uh, to be such a strong social engine? Um, and another very important question uh, would be, of course, what is housing? So uh, to paraphrase John Turner's famous etymology of housing, asking whether housing is a verb or a noun, a process or a product. Um, I frame housing as being simultaneously all of these things. Um, so housing is at the same time an act to house people, uh, a policy, which is a set of regulations, plans, funding schemes, a value, uh, civil rights or identity marker. It is also a typology, a settlement form, a space, uh, and cultural product, and of course, real estate, commodity, investment ch channel, and resource. So as you can see, I highlighted read the aspects of housing that are within the traditional scope of architecture. Um, as you may know, housing is discussed con at the moment primarily as a, as a matter of planning and policy, transitioning um, from state affair um, with neoliberalism to a matter of real estate development. The architectural aspects of housing are largely missing from contemporary discourse of housing, um, either as political product or as real, real estate product, while well, most of the discussion um, is in the policy and uh, real estate development aspects of it. The architectural question, what is housing, inquires what is a housing unit, how do we dwell, uh, how does it, um, the housing unit function, uh, what are its elements, how do uh, housing units compile together in, with other units to, to form buildings, neighborhoods, towns, and cities? Um, and these are distinct questions that my research deals with. So and as an architecture historian, I make two methodological proposals. One is an architectural analysis of housing, reading it as typology, settlement type, etc., And the other is a historical inquiry of housing to re-include housing into the historiography of Israel-Palestine. So when looking at the um, early history of Zionism, we can see that violent national conflict erupted some 20 years uh, after the formation of Zionism's two iconic built landscapes, the Hebrew city and the kibbutz. This historiographical gap points to a certain problem of cause and effect in our uh, history telling, which uh, offers housing as a key object of inquiry. So conducting uh, this uh, historical research, I make two non-traditional uh, methodological proposals. I propose a long history, uh, 1860 to 2011, 
that allows for examining long-term processes. And in order to perform this, I propose the study of pivotal cases rather than case studies. So while case studies represent many other cases and therefore present stable historical periods, I propose the study of pivotal cases, cases of pivotal change, uh, which mark changes in uh, long historical uh, processes. So uh, the Big Bang, if you, if you may, which enabled housing as a strategy in Israel-Palestine, um, was the Ottoman 1858 Land Commodification Code, which was a land co uh, modernization reform which changed the terms of land ownership throughout the uh, Ottoman Empire from a 600-year-old terms of ownership by cultivation to ownership by monetary purchase and formal registration. So the reform, which was part of the Tanzimat, uh, privatized the Sultan's uh, imperial land across the empire and enabled purchase of large tracts of land by a new class of landowners who developed large plantations for agricultural uh, for-profit production, employing a new class of landless serfs as labor. So historical maps, for example, of the Jaffa area show us the extent of this Big Bang. Uh, we have here an 1842 map of Jaffa as a walled city with nothing around it, and an 1880 map of the agricultural landscape for for-profit plantations, which were mainly oranges, um, Jaffa oranges, that formed in merely 20 years. So 40 years, sorry. Um, so historiography of these landscapes does not uh, really include the term plantation. We don't even have an Arabic or, or an Hebrew word for plantation uh, that embeds the exploitation aspect of this landscape. Uh, what we have is mata or mazra in, in Arabic, which only refer to the agriculture aspect um, of this agriculture. So only when we look at the architecture uh, of, of this plantation can we see what was really happening. The reform changed the traditional architecture of housing in Palestine, which was based on single room stone dwellings grouped together around courtyards to form defensive structures, as can be seen in these images and plans from the Jerusalem Hill area. Before the reform, each, each house with one roof grouped together into these social groups, uh, communal courtyards and forming those defensive structures. The plantations broke this typology down to parts, forming two new housing typologies. The first one uh, was a single room mud hut built by those landless serfs cultivating the plantation. The use of mud bricks made the courtyard um, iteration unsustainable due to erosion and the courtyard type was replaced with a cluster of single room structures that were forming the serf village. The second housing type was the multi-room house uh, serving the landowner. Um, so the entire courtyard uh, was now serving one house for a single owner, and it was built with the funds generated by the plantation's uh, uh, profit from cultivation, um, forming this as the plantation's big house. So my pivotal case here is the town of Mazra in the Western Galilee, which is literally farm, but essentially plantation, whose lands pretty much covered the entire Western Galilee. Historical maps show the size of this plantation and the geographical location of the two architectural types I was talking about. You can see the surf village at the bottom and the big houses of the landowners physically detached from the northern part of the plantation. So the architectural and geographical separation between classes, uh, those two new classes, marks a divide in Palestinian society far earlier than forming between Palestinians and Zionists and which has eroded uh, this society's social links and created two uh, classes with different interests regarding the land. Uh, while landowners' interest was in con controlling land uh, for for-profit uh, agriculture versus um, surf interest was in regaining connection to the land that they were cultivating. So the reform which enabled monetary purchase of land also enabled the entry of non-Muslims into uh, Palestine and the, and the formation of Jewish plantations as well. So Zionist organizations like the Jewish National Fund uh, purchased land and employed landless Zionist workers as labor in those plantations.
So at the Kinneret farm or plantation, however, Jewish workers rebelled against um, the landowning uh, mechanism, arguing for an alliance between the Jewish agency landowner and the landless workers as partners in forming the future national home. Workers argued that mere ownership cannot sustain without their labor and dwelling on the land and demanded self-sovereignty over this, the part of the national land. And this alliance took shape in the communal settlement form, the kibbutz, as the building block of the future nation. The architecture and settlement shape of the commune was the main site of contestation and negotiation between the landowner or landowning agencies and the commune of workers. Uh, Kibbutz Bet Alpha commune specifically, we just rejected the design proposed for it by the Jewish National Fund and its architect Richard Kaufman, claiming that uh, the proposed architecture proposed an enclosed courtyard that you can see here, was defensive colonial layout and eventually negotiated the kibbutz settlement mo model that we know today, which is quite iconic, as a single standing houses spread on the landscape, namely as a surf village. So negotiating over the architecture and, uh, and settlement layout of their homes, of their collective home, the commune, um, was the, the site where the landowners and the workers were um, negotiating and uh, in a sense um, um, arguing over what is the shape of the future proper home. Another important pivotal case is the Hebrew city of Tel Aviv, founded in 1909 um, with the premise of not being based on uh, industry or commerce as most modern cities, but on houses and on the idea of the city as a housing estate. Um, Tel Aviv's 1925 uh, master plan for expanding it uh, to become a city of 100,000 people was prepared by Sir Patrick Geddes as a city for urban workers based on the worker house as the cell unit of the urban block, uh, what Geddes termed uh, the home block. So the home block is composed of uh, the house unit forming two rings, an uh, inner ring and an outer ring, and at the center of it, a communal shared public space. Those uh, urban blocks were semi-autonomous and collectively managed uh, urban blocks, uh, spread uh, the layout adopted by the city's planning department and used by um, small communes of workers per occupation. Uh, Geddes' plan enabled urban workers to purchase small plots at the edges of the planned area based on future earnings and self-build small structures in areas where the city has not reached yet um, in a housing before street urban development model um, that still characterizes um, Israeli urbanism. So in other words, um, those uh, uh, Zionist urbanites did not wait for the city or, develop, or developers to build for them, but used the plan to produce the city. After the neighborhoods at the edges of the plan were, were built by the workers, the city extended urban services like running water, sewage and roads to reach them, forming the layout of the Geddes plan in a relatively short time. With statehood in 1948, uh, the state Zionism, in a sense, uh, bridged two of its major challenges. One of them was access to land and the other was access to the capacity to bring in many immigrants. But then it needed to face the task of housing millions of immigrants um, um, who, had, who were basically homeless. Immigrants were initially housed in former barracks of the British Army. Each uh, uh, immigrant only having their bed with no separation by gender and uh, no uh, um, inclusion of uh, families, which were uh, substandard uh, housing that were supposed to only be for a few days, but lasted for far longer than that. So in the first five years of uh, statehood, Israel, Israel produced three different housing schemes, which is an unprecedented number of plans which reflects the significance of housing to establishing the state, as well as the meaning of proper housing to citizens, especially in those years of fragile sovereignty. The first housing scheme was immigrant moshevim, or agricultural settlements, which attempted to replicate the kibbutz model and house, kibbutz, uh, house uh, uh, immigrants in border settlements in order to stake claims to state territory, and uh, as well as to shape those new immigrants new citizens by the kibbutz pioneer model. 
So my pivotal case here is Moshav Tirat Yehuda, uh, which settled immigrants from Tunis and Bulgaria on the lands of the former Palestinian village uh, or plantation. The formation of these border settlements, these border settlements were attacked by infiltrators, generating a lot of resentment by the immigrants of this settlement proposal, who resisted uh, the, their assigned role of, as pioneers and cannon for the border defense, uh, producing a lot of uh, social unrest and people unwilling to move there. The second housing scheme was the transitory camp, or Marbara, which transformed immigrants from the barrack housing to provisional family housing in tents, wooden and tin barracks, uh, shacks, sorry, surrounding existing settlements across the country. So uh, Salon Marbara was kind of a lab for, for the variety of transitory housing types, um, from tents to wooden and tin shacks. Yet all of these meager housing quickly deteriorated to substandard conditions and marked the immigrants as second-class citizens vis-a-vis -vis the veteran citizens who were living in uh, permanent and well-serviced housing. So the result of the social unrest uh, led to the third housing program in, in five years, um, the Citizen Dispersal Plan by Arya Sharon, known as the Sharon Plan. The plan meshed the goals of the two initial plans by using the immigrants to stake clams to the periphery of Israeli territory by forming immigrant towns, but housing them in proper permanent housing. These housing were based on the model of, uh, of the veteran citizen housing and exhibited to the public via exhibitions where people were expected to read plans uh, as a way of including the citizens in the process of their inclusion into the national home. The third program finally consolidated the Israeli housing regime uh, based on a conception shared by state and citizen alike, which identified proper housing with, with proper citizenship. The Israeli Ministry of Housing has invested in a number of elaborate housing estates, many involving experimental architecture design and novel technologies, which were important for consolidating Israeli architecture culture. And these were recognized in international architecture journals uh, of the time. Yet, this elaborate program for citizen housing did not apply to Israel's Arab-Palestinian population, the population that did not leave um, with statehood and remained to become Israeli citizens. So Mazra, which I mentioned before, is also a pivotal case for the formation of a housing strategy by Israel's Arab-Palestinian population after 1948. These are Palestinians who remain to become Israeli citizens but were not cared for by the Israeli housing regime and therefore had to produce their own housing strategy. Mazra became a site where many internal refugees, uh, Palestinian citizens were pushed to after 1948. The loosely populated plantation soon became a densely populated urban landscape of ever intensifying built environment. You can see here um, uh, the, the plantation versus um, this village in uh, the mid-50s. Now, one of the most dense Arab-Palestinian settlements in Israel, it exemplifies um, their uh, housing strategy of Tsumud, which is Arab Arabic for staying put, uh, versus the Palestinian claim for the right of return. Israeli-Palestinian claim for Tsumud means insisting on staying put in their, in their village and not living for whatever reason. This means building one's house on top of, behind of, or somehow on the family plot, defying any planning procedures, um, and creating a dense, very dense urban clusters. So for example, uh, one of the um, original surf uh, housing in Mazra has turned over the years from a one-room unit uh, with additional shacks to a housing complex for 12 uh, families uh, housing some 100 people, including three staircases and um, an elaborate system uh, of use of space. All of those uh, staircases do not necessarily even connect. And this is the facade of the same complex. Uh, you can see that the staircases do not even connect. Um, and this is all kind of a three-dimensional uh, agglomeration of, um, of units built on top of one another. So while housing is no longer a social good in Israel's neoliberal economy, um, 
recognized with the um, by and large failure of the 2011 protests, housing reappears in important junctions of Israeli public discourse with important uh, political implications that are, and, and that are cardinal for understanding Israel or Israel-Palestine as a regime of housing. An example uh, for that is the villa of General Gallant, publicly known as the Gallant Castle. Gallant was a leading candidate for the position of Israel Chief of Staff until this picture of his house appeared on the front covers of all Israeli papers in January 2011 and cost him the position revolving public outcry over the architecture of this house. The Gallant Castle invokes traces of colonial architecture in the Israeli landscape, which are familiar to all citizens, like the Antipatrist Caravanserai at the Afek Park, which is a popular uh, weekend destination, and many other Crusader and Ottoman forts. Um, the Gallant Villa is pretty explicitly one of the types, uh, kind of the classic types of fort uh, architecture, and this is important since Israelis want to think of themselves as the true natives to this homeland uh, who have returned after millennia and they re reject Palestinian definition of Zionism as colonialism. A chief of staff of the Israel Defense Forces, which is the People's Army, who is a colonial crusader, would have marked all of the Israeli uh, citizens as colonial crusaders, which Israelis could just not take. So the public outcry generated the fact that uh, Gallant lost his office and left the army. So the general who replaced um, uh, General Gantz as the chief of staff, um, General Gantz, lives in this house, uh, which is the Israeli good house, uh, a small house with a red roof. And by the way, General Gantz is now uh, a politician and the primary competitor with Netanyahu over the leadership. As this beautiful piece of work uh, by Gal Weinstein Ruf in the Israeli uh, pavilion in Sao Paulo shows, um, this type of, uh, of good house architecture can expand beyond its border and have uh, very um, um, strong uh, political stakes, but it, it can do this without punity, at least from the Israeli public. So it marks uh, the perseverance of Zionism as a regime defining itself via the terms of uh, citizenship and proper me membership uh, via proper housing. So to conclude, um, the study identifies housing as, as the cardinal uh, cultural and social product um, in the formation of Israeli um, um, nationalism and uh, social and social fabric, revolving struggles over the gain and loss of individual and collective home across the long history of Zionism from the 1860s to the present. Thank you.